Welcome, peace and the mercy and blessings of Allah be with you all. Thank you for joining me for this uh, live post. In this post, uh, I want to look at the gospel according to Mark. Just take a quick walk through the whole gospel uh, in an attempt to understand it as a whole. Uh, often people quote verses here and there, uh, but they don't have a sense of that whole uh, story. So we want to get the whole story so that when we are quoting from it, we, we do not uh, just pick and choose, but we have a, whole, a sense of the whole. Uh, so let me begin in the name of Allah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. I ask God to bless uh, his prophets, his messengers, all of the righteous people of all time. I ask uh, God to bless you all, uh, keep you all in good health and happiness, uh, give you protection from COVID-19, from every other sickness and disease and uh, stress and distress. So. I'm looking at uh, um, my screen where I have uh, opened from BibleHub.com the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1 in the New International Version. And uh, here uh, in, in Mark chapter 1, we have the opening scene where uh, John the Baptist is there preaching. And uh, he uh, preaches with words uh, from uh, the Old Testament where it says, uh, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Uh, so uh, some uh, Christians use this uh, passage to indicate that uh, Jesus must be Yahweh of the Old Testament. There's a long and complicated discussion that can ensue from this, but I want to take a quick walk through. And uh, for the moment, uh, it will suffice to say uh, that the passages have been modified in order to make it such that uh, the uh, there is a reference now to Jesus, yes, using words from the Old Testament, but Jesus is not being presented clearly in these passages as uh, Yahweh. If he is being presented as Yahweh, that presents another complication that we don't have time to explore now, but we will, God willing, deal with that in another um, uh, in another uh, presentation. So for the moment, uh, there's nothing here that indicates the divinity of Jesus. Rather, it indicates uh, that he needs someone to come before him and who is going to baptize him, which happens now in this uh, case. Uh, John the Baptist is here baptizing um, and uh, people who are confessing their sins, coming to him to be baptized. Uh, and uh, in this context, it says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the uh, Jordan. And then when Jesus came up of the out of the water, uh, that's when um, he saw, that is, Jesus saw mm, heaven being opened and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now, this declaration from, from God in, in Mark's gospel uh, does not seem to be a very public event. It seems that only Jesus experienced this. So Mark is telling the story from the point of view of Jesus. And uh, so uh, the, the declaration, you are uh, my son, this day um, I have uh, uh, begotten you. Uh, this has been interpreted by some to indicate that Jesus was adopted by God on this particular day. God is declaring uh, I have, uh, um, you, you are my son. So that means from this day onwards, you are my son. That, that is what we call son by adoption. It is by an open declaration. I can um, just uh, look quickly at the comments and make sure that I, uh, I'm coming through well enough of, in terms of voice and, uh, and the image is fine. So I see here that uh, Jinnah uh, Sev, Severus uh, uh, Fahad is saying, May Allah bless Brother Dr. Shabir Ali. Thank you, Brother Jina. And I see Sister Joyce Taylor saying, Salam alaikum as salam, Sister Joyce and uh, Nehan uh, asking, Shabir, can you elaborate on the point about Jesus suffering for others in Mark chapter 14? Okay, we'll get to that. Uh, so, so far, it doesn't look like anyone is pointing out any problems. So, I should, I hope everything is fine. And I see that someone has shared my stream about a minute ago. I want to thank you for that. Um, I cannot read the name of the person who did this, uh, but uh, uh, because it's written in another language, but I, I thank you and may Allah bless you all. Okay, so I'll go back to uh, my walk through the gospel according to Mark, and here we are. Uh, so 
uh, it seems to be a private event uh, that, that God announces to Jesus uh, that you are my son. Uh, why do I say that? Because there is no consequence in the crowd. Like nobody comes up and says, oh, well, that, that, that means, you, means you are the son of God. Uh, it looks like for a long time, people are still trying to figure out who exactly is Jesus, uh, what role does he have to play. And uh, it, it, it's a later declaration, much later, in, in, in that, that somebody will declare that Jesus is the son of God. So, whereas if, if God had publicly, um, with a voice from heaven, uh declare that jesus is the son of god that you know people would be saying that he's the son of god from there onwards that would be like his uh, almost his middle name jesus son of god or his last name um but but it doesn't happen so it's a private event it seems okay so now uh, at once jesus is uh, led into the desert by the uh satan he is actually um Oh, how does it say here? Once the Spirit sent him into the wilderness, and he was uh, in the wilderness 40 days. So the New International Version of the Bible is mild here in saying the Spirit sent him. Uh, but uh, the text literally in Greek says that he drove him into the desert. Anyway, we, we, but, and that would show a kind of a subordinate role of, for Jesus. Nonetheless, uh, Jesus uh, announces the good news after John is put into prison. Uh, Jesus uh, says the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. So uh, he is um, obviously here pre presenting the same message which John the Baptist already presented before him, uh, repent and believe in the, in the um, what did John the Baptist say? So John the Baptist came, he was preaching a repentance, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus is preaching also repent and believe in the good news. Uh, John call, uh, Jesus calls his disciples, he appoints uh, them, um, and um, that's important to remember that Jesus appoints disciples uh, because these disciples will uh, appear throughout the gospel and they are the ones whom Jesus commissioned to teach his message. And for Muslims, it's important to know who the disciples are, uh, not necessarily to know the names of all of them, but also uh, to know some of the chief ones who were there preaching with Jesus, like uh, John and and Peter and um, and James, and um, uh, the names are mentioned here: Andrew, the brother of uh, Peter, who is called Simon at this time. Um, and it is important to know who is not in among the the twelve. Uh, most notably, Paul is not among the twelve, but Paul becomes an important teacher of Christianity uh, later on. Uh, Jesus drives out uh, an evil spirit. This whole evil spirit says, I, I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. So some uh, see here, this too is a uh, reference to Jesus' divinity, but it's not a very clear reference. You, you are the Holy One of God. So what? Uh, you know, the, you, it could be that you're a holy person and, uh, and, and you're a person of God. So you're a Holy One of God. Um, but Jesus says, be quiet, which could mean that Jesus, uh, either that it's Jesus' true identity and he doesn't want it to be revealed, which is a running theme throughout Mark's gospel, uh, or, you know, on the ground, if Jesus actually said this, forget about what Mark means by it, uh, it could be that Jesus is not accepting that this is uh, true about him, like that, that, that the evil spirit should speak like this. Maybe he thinks that the evil spirit is trying to deceive people. In any case, he calls the evil spirit to come out of the man. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out uh, of him with a... A shriek. Now, the, the fact that the evil spirit does this, um, like shakes the man violently, you can see that this, uh, the, what we have in Mark's gospel is a powerful Jesus. Yes, Jesus does these miraculous wonders, uh, but, but the, 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 the wonders that he performs uh, are, are in a way limited. Uh, so in the case of this demon, so Jesus is commanding the demon, get out of him. Uh, so, so the demon possessed the man and Jesus was saying, get out of him. So you would expect that the demon would, uh, you know, like a whimpering puppy, um, just quietly leave the man, right? Because he's being commanded by God here. Uh, but uh, the demon takes his last uh, shot. He like he violently shakes the man and then and then comes out, which shows that Jesus has some power, but uh, it is not absolute the, the absolute power of uh, of 
God. Uh, in any case, uh, we move on. And, and now people are saying, oh, look, you know, this guy has a new teaching and he's teaching with authority. He even gives orders to the impure spirits and they obey him. So news uh, about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So you see what's happening here is that people are, are you know, wondering, like, who is this guy? It's not like uh, they heard the declaration already that Jesus is the son of God from the voice in heaven. And uh, they, they now know who he is. It's like they are in some kind of an amazement and wonderment about who he is. Uh, okay, so Jesus then heals many. He deals, heals people who are demon possessed. He heals Simon Peter's uh, mother-in-law. Uh, then Jesus goes to pray in a solitary place. Uh, so that's uh, uh, interesting because Jesus uh, is is going off on his own and he's praying. So who is he praying to? Obviously, in Mark's gospel, Jesus is not God. He is praying to the Almighty God. So they went and uh, they said to him, the disciples said to him, everybody's looking for you. And uh, uh, Jesus says, uh, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So Jesus came obviously to preach the, uh, something. He came to preach a message and he has to go around from village to village to preach the message. If he came to die for the sins of the world, you would expect that uh, there's no need to preach a message. He just comes dies for the sins of the world and that itself is the is the message as people say that that message was already clear from the old testament so there would have been no uh, no need to preach a new message he just has to go and publicly die on the cross and everybody would know that message from the old testament but obviously that whole story about jesus dying for the sins of the world uh, is not so evident from the whole um uh, presentation of Jesus from the start. Uh, Jesus is presented here as a prophet who comes to preach a message from God to the people so that people can uh, reform based on that message. Anyway, to continue, and we're getting to the end of chapter one, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. So a man comes, he has leprosy. Jesus uh, uh, says, if you, have, uh, uh, if you are willing, then you can be made clean. Um, the, the, the man says, if you are willing, uh, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, uh, I am willing. And he said, be clean. Um, and uh, the man, uh, leprosy left the man. Now, Jesus uh, sent him away with a strong warning. See that you do not tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded you for cleansing as a testimony to them. Uh, so Jesus is commanding him to go and perform the sacrifices in the temple, uh, which means that the sacrifices were still in effect. And if Jesus knew that within a few years, because it'll be just uh, within, in Mark's gospel, there's only uh, one year between this event and the, God, and, the, and the ending, the crucifixion. But let's say we take the um, longer sort of scenario, which is presented in John's gospel, and uh, understand that there are three years. Still, if Jesus knows that within three years, he's going to be dying as a sacrifice uh, for the entire world for all of the sins, then why would he command the man to go and perform the sacrifice? Well, you might say, okay, this is because uh, the sacrifices, Jesus' sacrifice has not been made yet. Uh, so, the man is, uh, uh, you know, is still following the law, which still applies uh, about sacrifices. But we will see that even in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Christians are still performing the sacrifices. And this is after uh, the crucifixion of Jesus has already come to pass. Uh, so uh, the the story does not really add up in any as we see here Jesus is commanding the man to continue uh, to offer the sacrifices now the way in which the wording is here is that he's telling him do it as a testimony to them as if this uh, is for a purpose and maybe the sacrifice itself is not needed what is needed is for it to be a testimony uh, to the the other people uh, to the priests so they can see that okay what uh, you know Jesus did this and uh, um, you know because they'll try to find out like where, where did this man get this uh, get healed and they will realize that Jesus is there uh, as an important uh, healer um, but you know the, the 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 means that are used for this 
th this purpose, uh, th th that 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 method has to be something that is genuine within faith. That Jesus cannot um, order the man to do something that is sinful, and surely if the animal sacrifices were not necessary, then killing the animal will the animals will be of no. Uh, avail and and that will be something that may, you know you, you cannot just go kill animals for no good uh, reason so that that's mark chapter one and um, i will take a quick uh, walk through mark chapter two and then i'll take your questions okay so mark chapter two uh, jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man that's right at the top of the chapter uh, so what does he say? He says to them, uh, when, when he sees the faith of the people, he says to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. But, but notice the way he says it, your sins are forgiven. The, uh, the commentators point out that this is given in the passive form, which is another way of saying God has forgiven your sins. It's, it's not that Jesus is forgiving the sins. If he is forgiving the sins, he could say, I am forgiving your sins. Now, even using the passive, one can argue, you know, even if Jesus forgave the sins, it can still be put in the passive. But the, the basic presupposition that should be applied here is that when Jesus is speaking now, uh, because he has not revealed himself to be God, he, then he is obviously praying to God. So when he says, your sins are forgiven, and this is in the position of a prophet declaring to the man the knowledge he has from God that God has forgiven the sins of this man. This is what is referred to as circumlocution uh, in the Gospels where uh, the Jews are um, hesitant to pronounce the name of God. So they find passive ways of referring to the actions of God so they don't have to mention God. Uh, so your sins are forgiven means God has forgiven you but it's said in a way to avoid mentioning the word God because that, that became the Jewish practice and Jesus was from that uh, milieu. So now uh, some uh, teachers of the law were there, they're saying, they're, these are Jewish scholars now and, they, and they're saying, uh, oh, why does he talk like that? He's blaspheming, who can forgive sins but God alone? Uh, so then Jesus knew uh, that that was what they were thinking. So he said, why are you thinking those things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, uh, uh, take your mat and walk. But I, I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So if he's referring to himself as the son of man here, which seems a little obvious from the context, uh, then uh, he has authority on earth to forgive sins. Whereas uh, God has authority on earth and in heaven to forgive sins. You see, there's a difference here. So when somebody jumps up and says, look, Jesus is forgiving sins. Well, he, he has the authority and obviously the authority is given to him from God uh, to, to announce the forgiveness of people on, on the earth. So uh, if Jesus says, I forgive you, um, but, but he doesn't really say that, but he says um, he has been given authority to forgive sins, uh, but on earth, that means he has a limited scope and authority. And it's not like he is the almighty God who has unlimited scope and authority both in heaven and uh, on earth. So he tells the man to pick up his mat and go home. And uh, the man does that. And uh, the Mark's gospel says this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this, which means that they didn't praise Jesus is because at this point, they haven't recognized Jesus to be God. So it's not like they're praising Jesus and calling him God. They're praising God who they recognize to be someone other than Jesus. Now, Jesus uh, calls uh, Levi and he sits down to eat with uh, people who are regarded as sinners and tax collectors. People are saying, you know, why is he doing all of that? And uh, Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So this means, it could mean two things. One is that some people are self-righteous. So Jesus is saying, I have no business with you. But two, it could be that some people are already righteous by following the law and he's not here to change that. So Jesus did not come to call the righteous. He only come, came to call the sinners, those who were not connected to the law of God and the book of God. He's calling those. And that means that people already had the means of achieving salvation even before Jesus came. And uh, despite the fact that Jesus came, people could still continue to achieve the salvation that they uh, knew to be described uh, in the scriptures uh, before them. 
And now Jesus is asked about fasting and uh, he says, uh, you know, when he leaves, then the, his disciples will fast. And uh, Muslims to this day, being uh, followers of Jesus and all of the prophets, we do fast. Now in verse number 21, it says, uh, Jesus gives a saying about new wine in, in old wineskins and so on. Um, so that's an interesting uh, saying. Uh, it indicates in a rough way that Jesus is here. Um, and he is uh, going to teach some uh, new teachings, uh, not uh, entirely new in terms of uh, uh, turning over uh, what was taught before, but maybe giving a new uh, emphasis, a new spirit uh, to that law. The way the Quran puts it is that Jesus would uh, abrogate some of the things which were previously um, required of people. Uh, so that I may make permissible some of that which was previously uh, made uh, forbidden to you. And here is an example coming up at the end of the second chapter of Mark's Gospel. On the Sabbath, Jesus was uh, going through the grain fields and the disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He said, uh, uh, yeah, have you not heard what, read what David did? So when David was uh, and his companions were hungry and in need, uh, they um, ate from the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. So he's saying, in a nutshell, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And so the uh, Sabbath uh, is a set of regulations that uh, on this day you are to rest, you are not to work, you can't do this and that. Uh, but uh, even though it was the Sabbath, Jesus allowed his disciples to uh, go through the grain fields and pluck the grain. Um, and uh, some objected, this is unlawful, but Jesus is saying, look, um, the Sabbath is made for the man, not the man for the Sabbath. So uh, we're, we're not going to sacrifice the human beings for the sake of the Sabbath, but we could sacrifice the, sa the sab sabbatical laws, uh, the, the laws of the Sabbath, uh, to facilitate human beings. So we have that in Islamic Sharia as well, that there is a concept of maslaha. We should not think that the law is so fixed uh, that even if people are suffering from the, trying to apply the law, they still have to go ahead and suffer because that is the law. No, the, the uh, law is made for the man. It's not that the man is made for the law. You don't sacrifice the man to keep the law. Uh, you, you, you modify the law to keep the person, to save the person. Um, and and that's what it means. And then the comment here at the end, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Uh, this in, in this version of the Bible is given in red as if this is the saying of Jesus. But uh, this sounds more like the commentary of Mark. Mark is adding here that uh, the, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Um, because that's the conclusion from that whole story. It uh, seems unlikely that Jesus himself said it in this in this way. Uh, we should remember that when the uh, authors, uh, the original authors of the New Testament wrote, they didn't write with two colored pens, like black for everything else, and then red for the letters, uh, for the words of Jesus. Nor did they use quotation marks so we can see where the saying of Jesus started and where the saying of Jesus ended. Sometimes there's this ambiguity. And here, uh, the this, this statement is included as a statement of Jesus. That's in Mark chapter tw uh, uh, 2, verse number 28. But it looks li like this is more. Uh, the the um, conclusion from Mark himself, the, the, the writer of the Gospel. So those are two chapters we have uh, walked through in the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, God willing, in future posts, uh, I will walk through the rest of the Gospel with you, uh, the Gospel according to Mark. And if time permits, God gives us life and uh, opportunity and guides us to serve his way. Uh, we will, inshallah, walk through uh, other Gospels as well. And the rest of the New Testament, perhaps the rest of the Bible. And there's so much more that I myself need to learn, uh, but doing it this way gives me more, um, um, uh, like it adds to, adds to my knowledge as, as, we, as we go. So at this point, uh, I will uh, pause uh, and look at your comments and questions and um, try to answer them the best that I can. In the meantime, I see that uh, several other persons have uh, shared uh, the post uh, after the last time I looked. So I want to give thanks to all of these persons as I give thanks to Allah. May Allah bless you all and 
I thank you for that. So I see uh, Ahla Abu Bakr uh, Mustafa has shared uh, and Abdullah Mustafa say uh, and uh, uh, apparently Abdullah Mustafa you've done it many times. May Allah's brother reward you. Okay and uh, someone else whose name I didn't recognize that I mentioned before. Uh, so thank you all for doing that and uh, I want to look at your comments so let me see who has commented here and what questions you have. I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability and uh, then we'll be done for the day. Okay, so Jina, uh, okay, we looked at your comment before and uh, Nahyan asking me, can you elaborate on the point about Jesus suffering for others in Mark chapter 14? So uh, Nahyan, I, I didn't get there yet, but let me see. Let me see what it says here in Mark chapter 14. So I see the specific reference. Uh, so in Mark chapter 14. Okay, so Jesus is there with his disciples. And in chapter 20, it says, uh, the, uh, chapter, uh, in, this is chapter 14, verse number 21. Uh, Jesus says, the son of man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It will be better for him if he had not been born. So this son of man, it's written for him to go in a particular way. So it looks like this uh, crucifixion is predetermined. It has to happen and Jesus is going along the way it uh, has to happen. Um, where does it say here um, about Jesus dying for the sins? Is that what you're asking about? Jesus suffering for others. Um, and then he okay so tw verse 24 Three, he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and they all drank from it and verse 24 he said this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many and uh, then he did he give them for the bread as well on who where's my guess Passover hmm. where is it that, where is it in Mark's gospel that he gave them the the bread as well. That's curious. I have to look at that some more. I didn't uh, notice that point before. It looks like only the drink is given here. Like in other gospels, it's like he, he also breaks the bread and he gives it to them. Um, and he said, this is my body. But I don't see that in Mark's gospel. Maybe I'm missing something because I'm just scrolling through very quickly here. Uh, so it's evening, he arrived at the 12, this is verse number 17, and he acknowledges that there are people eating with him. It's one of the 12, okay. Uh, 20, verse number 22, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and uh, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. So he says, this is my body, but he doesn't say this is given for others. And uh, then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. It's interesting here, he said the blood of the covenant. He doesn't say my blood, the blood of the covenant. Um, and in some manuscripts, it says the blood of the new covenant. Um, hmm. So you discover something every day. So there's some uh, nuance here in the gospel according to Mark, which is different from the other gospels, where in Mark, it's not so clear that he is saying uh, uh, that this is my blood or am i missing something if somebody notices that please um uh, you know uh, point that out to me uh, so but 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 let's let's get to the heart of your question uh nahian let's say that that you know jesus said uh, that um let's say that jesus said this is you know my body that is being broken on the cross uh, and it is done for the for the sins of many. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, to be sure, uh, Mark says that he, that Mark shows that Jesus said that uh, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Uh, so he didn't say my, but son of man, probably that's the wording there, if we go look at it. So that is more, I think, what, what you're asking about. And in that case, what can we say? We can say that 
this means that uh, Jesus uh, is being uh, crucified uh, for, um, let, let's say, for the sins of, of the people. Uh, now, did Jesus actually say these words? Uh, we can see that in Mark's Gospel, it's not exactly these words. And, but let's say that Jesus said these words. Well, then it would mean that he is uh, in some way uh, drawing the people close to God by being an intermediary between them and God. But then uh, why would God require that? It, it, to, to Muslims, it doesn't make sense that God would require somebody to die in the place of uh, the other people. But there is great doubt as to whether Jesus actually said these words exactly as, as, as is depicted in especially some of the other Gospels. And we can see in the earliest of the four Gospels, in, in, in Mark's Gospel, uh, there is some difference in the wording at, the, at what is called the Eucharist, that meal that Jesus shared with his uh, disciples. Uh, to, to say that Jesus said that he died as a ransom for many, the ransom language itself is problematic. Because when you think of ransom, you think of somebody being kidnapped and then there is a ransom to be paid so that the, um, the person who is kidnapped will be re released. But then the, the ransom money is paid to the kidnapper. So if uh, Jesus is paying his life as a ransom uh, for uh, the release of good people then who was holding them captive to whom if, is jesus paying this ransom it doesn't look good to say that uh, god kept everyone in captivity and jesus is giving his life as a sacrifice to god uh, for god to release everybody else because that makes god appear to be very cruel to the point of demanding the life of his son and if you say well it's the devil that kept everyone captive uh, and Jesus is giving his life so that the devil could uh, release everyone, that too doesn't look very good because it means that the devil is in equal bargaining terms with God. He is uh, demanding of God to sacrifice his son uh, for the release of God's people. And uh, that doesn't seem good either. So some come to different uh, understandings, like for example, Jesus, uh, by being on the cross, he was victorious over the devil. Uh, some, so this is a Christus Victor model. Uh, some think that Jesus, by being on the cross, was healing people. Uh, so by, you know, people seeing the suffering of Jesus, they feel moved and touched and uh, they rectify their own lives as a result they can't become good persons and so on so different ways or some might see this as an expression of love from the part of jesus but then uh, how is that expression of love if somebody sacrifices himself uh, for no reason so then that brings us back to the reason like why was it necessary for him to be sacrificed and so you know the problem continues so altogether i think uh, brother nahian that's a uh, problematic uh, belief okay and uh, and he's saying, Jesus said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for uh, many. Okay, so it says my blood. Why didn't it say that in this translation, Nahian? So you're looking at 1423. I was looking at the same one. So Jesus uh, in John in Mark chapter 14, verse 23, and this is in the New International Version. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And then verse number 24, this is my blood of the covenant. Yes, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. So my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, but it didn't say that uh, this is for the sins uh, of, uh, of many. So why is it poured out for many? Uh, now in, in John's gospel, if you make a side comment here, even though uh, much in John's gospel is not uh, to be credited directly to Jesus, this is more uh, a later, um, you know, elaboration of what Jesus said. But in John's Gospel, there is a curious note which uh, seems uh, to have some, uh, uh, it, it, it needs to be considered. See, in John's Gospel, it says that we, when the uh, Jewish leaders were deliberating about what to do about Jesus, um, and there was a suggestion to kill him, so one of them said, uh, it is better that for one man to die than for the, you know, Romans to come in and uh, and and, you know, uh, decimate the entire populace. Uh, so uh, they're afraid, obviously, that Jesus is an insurrectionist 
and uh, at least that's how the Romans will see him. And, and the Romans will come down on everybody. It's like, uh, you know, some like, like the Americans uh, bombing Afghanistan uh, because they think uh, Osama bin Laden is there. And uh, so, you know, that was the question, what would the Taliban do? Would they hand over Osama bin Laden? Uh, or would they, you know, stay and fight and uh, suffer the consequences? Um, you know, many uh, decades, a couple of decades ago, they chose the latter. And uh, but the the Jewish leaders at the time uh, chose the former. They said, uh, you know, uh, let's hand over Jesus so that let the one man die, then for the whole nation to perish. And uh, so that doesn't mean that he's dying for the sins of the world. And, and it doesn't say so specifically in this uh, passage that it says it's a new, it's a covenant and some manuscripts add a new covenant, uh, but uh, it doesn't say what that covenant entails. And um, it doesn't say that the blood itself is going to wash away the sin. So there's a sort of nuance there that uh, should be paid attention to. And, and we see a development, like something is not so very clear in Mark, but the other gospels make it clearer. And uh, it make it clearer from a Christian point of view, they're trying to modify the story and make it more Christian as, as we go. Um, okay, Mahmoud Al-Fawzan, and Doctor, I'm always happy with your lectures. May Almighty Allah increase our Iman. Thank you, my brother Mahmoud. Please uh, keep making dua for me. And may Allah SWT increase you and everyone around you in terms of faith and happiness and uh, every bounty that comes from him. Uh, Salman Haider, greetings Dr. Ali and Salam, alaikum salam and greetings, thank you. And Nahyan, did, did, did Jesus predict his own imminent death and resurrection or was, was those pre, were those predictions um, uh, made and altered later uh, by the gospel uh, authors for their own theological reasons? So, uh, Nahyan, you know, we cannot always know like what happened precisely in history, but, but I understand your question and uh, let me answer to the best of my ability. Uh, the, the Gospels show that Jesus predicted both his death and resurrection on several occasions. Even Mark's Gospel shows that and we'll come to that later. Mark chapter nine, uh, chapter eight, first chapter nine, first chapter, uh, uh, chapters eight, nine, ten. Again and again, Jesus is saying in a very clear way that he is going to be arrested and killed. He was, he's going to be crucified. And then after three days, he will rise again. So you would expect that all the disciples know it from, and not, not only the disciples, but everyone, this would be public knowledge. And yet uh, it turns out that uh, when these events uh, started to unfold, as described in the gospels, the disciples are are all puzzled by this even after the whole crucifixion scene they've had a whole day the sabbath to think about it and uh, to reflect and remember what jesus said to them uh, by sunday you think they they they, they all are ready to know that jesus is going to raise from the dead and they, you know if i were one of them you would expect uh, i would want to go camp out near the tomb to be the first one to greet jesus when he comes out but uh, it so happens that the women were nonchalantly going along uh, to visit the tomb uh, and uh, you know they found the tomb to be empty they're surprised mary of magdala according to john um, john's gospel it thinks that somebody has taken away the body of jesus she doesn't know where they have put the body uh, the disciples are all puzzled and then they come to inspect the tomb themselves and uh, John's gospel says uh, they, they did not know uh, or they did not understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Why would they not know or understand it up to this time? In fact, John's gospel puts it that they didn't know and some are trying to interpret that to mean uh, they knew it, but they didn't understand it, you know, but but why would they not know it or understand it by this time if Jesus had already predicted it so clearly uh, previously? So the, the best explanation of that is that Jesus did not predict it so clearly and that uh, these words are not really his. This was added into the speech of Jesus by, you know, by the gospel writers or by people before them, but certainly after Jesus. Um, in order to fulfill their own theological needs. Ahmed Abbas, Salam alaikum Dr. Shabir. I find the reasons of calling Jesus the Messiah in Islamic sources unsatisfying. My understanding of the term Messiah is that it means someone dedicated for the service of God. I was thinking about Jesus' grandmother, uh, the woman of Imran, according to Surah 3 verse 35, and forward the woman of Imran dedicated what was in her womb uh, to the service of God. When the baby turned out to be a girl, the woman called the baby Mary and commanded Mary 
and her offspring to be to the protection of God. The next verse uh, says that God accepted Mary. Could this be the reason why Jesus is called the Messiah, son of Mary in the Quran? Because his mother and he were dedicated to the service of God and God and uh, and God accepted. I noticed that almost always in the Quran, Jesus is called Messiah, son of Mary. Uh, almost always uh, uh, Mary is mentioned with the term a Messiah, as if Jesus' Messiahship is related to Mary and the, accepted, and the acceptance of the dedication of uh, Jesus' grandmother. What do you think of this? So, uh, I, I agree with you, my brother, that um, the uh, term Messiah uh, refers to someone who is dedicated to the service of God. Uh, now, Mary was also dedicated to the service of God, but the term Messiah is, as you can see, is not directly applicable to her. Um, though uh, I, I don't see why it couldn't, but but that but the Quran does not apply it. Um, the, the, the Quran does speak of her as being chosen in Allah has tafaki. God has chosen you, um, and so God has chosen Mary. Um, so that would make Mary, you know, very important, uh, perhaps even to the extent of being a prophet, according to some Muslim scholars uh, throughout uh, during our history. Uh, uh, but the term Messiah, I agree with you, would um, uh, refer to Jesus as someone who is dedicated to the service of, of God. Okay, Roshan, all of the four Gospels must be read in comparative and co collectively, then only uh, one must get the correct answers. Yes, Roshan, I agree with you uh, that uh, we need to read them, uh, uh, you know, read through each Gospel. We also need to read them side by side, comparatively, read across the Gospels, read the whole Bible uh, to get the full sense. But we have to do, you know, take one, st one baby step after another. Uh, so please bear with us as we do that. Brother Maniv, uh, Salam Dr. Ali, do we know more about what the authors of the New Testament uh, themselves thought of what they were writing? Uh, uh, as in, did they and the early Christians consider all of the texts of the Gospels as scripture and from God, like most Christians later on would think? Wa alaikum salam, Brother Maniv. Uh, it's it's unlikely that the writers of the of the Gospels and the, and the writers of the rest of the New Testament knew uh, that their uh, scripture was you know the way Christians would later regard them as the Word of God. The, a, a notable exception to this may be the Book of Revelation. Uh, where the author is clearly describing a vision that he has and he, he takes to be a revelatory vision. Uh, so in that case, we don't, one would say the book of Revelation, but even then somebody apparently added a passage uh, to the at the end of that book, uh, which says if anyone adds anything to this book, which is ironic because uh, there's a passage there uh, threatening damnation for the, anyone who would add anything to the book, but that passage itself is thought by Christian scholars to be a later addition, as I pointed out in a previous um, live post. Uh, nonetheless, uh, for the rest of the Gospels, uh, for, for the rest of the writings of the New Testament, and uh, the Gospels in particular, there is no such uh, uh, overarching belief that, you know, that could be credited to the author as if the author thinks that this is really uh, the, the word of God. There was a, a, a belief among uh, Christians traditionally uh, that is referred to as verbal plenary um, revelation, where they thought that uh, the, the words uh, are, are precisely as God uh, inspired the writers to write. So as if the writers were uh, being used as instruments to just uh, robotically write the, the, the words that were, you know, um, almost being dictated uh, uh, to them. Uh, but that, that belief is hardly held by um, the mainstream uh, writers today. I, I don't come across writers who are writing from that perspective. Mostly people nowadays are noticing errors in the Gospels and the other writings and they're saying, well, you know, these are due to the fact that God allowed the writers to use their knowledge and uh, their experience in, in, in writing and their own expressions and so on. Uh, so that you can expect such errors might occur, and but they're excusable. But the main message is not corrupted. Um, but but no, they did. That means that they did not have 
the same idea that that these are all you know inspired scripture the writers themselves and then when uh, since uh, when the writers did not have it then their immediate contacts naturally would not have it and we can see that for uh, many years people did not have it because what we notice is that the mark is written the first of the four gospels and then Matthew and Luke are, are written based on Mark, and they're uh, modifying the information which is found in Mark. So though they're using Mark as a source, they are clearly changing what they find in Mark. And uh, John's Gospel was thought to be independent uh, of the other three, but uh, most recently, uh, scholars have been gravitating towards the view that uh, uh, Mark's, uh, John's Gospel is actually uh, based on uh, Mark as well, uh, and it's a rewriting of Mark. This was clearly pointed out in in a in a book by edited by Helen Bond and others, and I think I have it here nearby because I reviewed it recently, and it is still on my table here. I think, or maybe I've moved it. Oh, it is here. Um, so it is book uh, this book John's transformation of uh, Mark, uh, edited by Helen Bond and uh, and other. Uh, writer. So it's a collection of articles by various scholars who appeared in the conference uh, discussing the very subject and now their articles are put together in this book. So now uh, the, the, the way in which the later gospel writers used the gospel according to Mark and modified the information shows that they did not regard Mark's gospel as being uh, the word of God. Uh, in, in the way that Christians later on would, would think of it. Otherwise, they would not modify it. They would just follow and copy. Uh, and uh, by the same token, as they were writing in this way, modifying and, and changing for their own theological uh, agendas, uh, they naturally did not regard their own writings to be uh, such rebel, verbal revelations uh, from, from God. So... Uh, in, in short, it's not like Muslims believe about the Quran, that this is the very word of God, let us preserve it, let us uh, get the exact words and so on, and let's pass it on. Okay, Salu Salman, uh, Salam Dr. Shabir, yesterday I saw the movie of Jesus where they show him on the cross and then he dies, and after that they bury him in a tomb, but later one lady visits him, but she doesn't find his body, and later Jesus shows himself to his disciples and his mother, and he stays with them and eats food. What does uh, this mean in the Islamic view well this uh, you know the, the, this is what is shown in the Gospels and uh, the Islamic view uh, does not need to negate all of those uh, details uh, the Islamic view can be uh, as I've elaborated in another uh, post uh, that uh, let's say Jesus was taken down from the cross and they thought he was dead but he wasn't quite dead and and God uh, um, took him into heaven well then uh, from heaven, God could have shown a vision to the disciples. They saw Jesus uh, appearing to them from heaven, almost like something that is described in Matthew's gospel, where they go up to the mountain and they see him from that height. And um, uh, some doubt it because the vision is not so very clear uh, to them. Some think it's Jesus, some think it's not Jesus. And uh, But but those who are convinced that it is Jesus, they are the ones who become the uh, driving force uh, for the Christian message and uh, they take the message far and wide. And uh, later on, uh, you know, stories emerge about Jesus coming back, uh, eating with his disciples and so on. So this is a later exaggeration, which is found in the later Gospels, such as, uh, for example, the Gospel of Luke and also the Gospel according to John. Okay, salut. Dr. Shabir, if the Gospels explicitly claim that Jesus came to visit his disciples and his family even after his death, then why can't we believe it? And why doesn't Allah mention about it in the Quran? Are you personal? And you personally believe that Jesus indeed returned to his disciples after his death? What makes you believe this? So, uh, let's say we, we um, concede that, okay, Jesus uh, came and he dwelt with his disciples, he ate with them and so on. Well, uh, then you can't have it both ways. You can't have it that, uh, you know, he died in the first place and then he came back and he is now, um, well, you can, you can have it. But but if one were to uh, try to analyze the whole story, what what's happening now is that historians looking at this are saying, uh, look, it's either... Uh, either uh, these stories are not true, it's not true that Jesus came and ate with his disciples after the crucifixion scene, uh, or 
uh, it must be that at the crucifixion he wasn't quite killed and he was still able to come back and eat with his disciples. Now, uh, our Christian friends would say, but yeah, but when he met with his disciples and ate with them and so on, he must have told them the truth uh, that I wasn't really dead. And how did everyone come to believe that he was dead? So uh, the answer to that would be that uh, there is some exaggeration in the stories and uh, perhaps the words that people are report reporting from Jesus are not uh, uh, really his and 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 so on so you know somebody has to make sense of the whole story the whole scenario uh, so from from a, a muslim point of view uh, the best i would say is is not to take these stories as being reliable that jesus actually came and at ate and, and drank with his disciples after the crucifixion scene uh, they, it will be reasonable to concede that jesus uh, appeared to his disciples as a vision from heaven as an assurance to them that uh, Jesus was still alive. And uh, some Christian scholars themselves reconstruct the, the storyline uh, to at least acknowledge this bare minimum, such as Raymond Brown in his book, uh, Introduction to New Testament uh, Christology. So uh, the, 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 it's, it's not uh, that I have accepted that these stories are true. Sometimes for the sake of argument, I say, okay, suppose you take these stories as true as is depicted in the gospel according to Luke that Jesus came and ate with his disciples, then this would uh, in a way indicate that he wasn't really dead in the first place. Um, you know, so I put that as a, as a way of arguing the point. Uh, Lubika uh, saying, Salam Alaikum, may Allah bless, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your family. Thank you, Sister Lubika, you and your family as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and uh, protect you all from every um, uh, difficulty. Uh, Nahyan saying, was Jesus' uh, spear thrusted in John chapter 19, verse 36 and 37? Is the spear thrust historical? Uh, but Nahyan, most uh, scholars now would say that this is not uh, a historical. Raymond Brown in his two-volume commentary on John's gospel says about the same. Uh, John has obviously introduced this uh, into his writing for his own theological purposes, and it's not uh, a historical event. Uh, Salu uh, saying, Dr. Shabir, what uh, you say about the missing of Jesus' body from the tomb? Was it stolen? Was it taken to heaven? Does the crucified body of Jesus still exist? Now, uh, Salu, the, uh, you know, it's not so uh, solidly established that the tomb was discovered to be empty. Um, uh, you know, and, and even if the, there was a story that the women went and they found the tomb to be empty, you know, it, it's not so clear that they found the correct tomb. I know the writers of the Gospels are trying pains to make it clear that they went to the right tomb. Uh, the, the later the Gospel, the more they assure us that the women were close up to the scene, they could see the tomb, they knew where it was, and more and more women. So there are more witnesses, everybody know, even the beloved disciple, a male disciple now of Jesus, uh, and now uh, is there at the cross. And and uh, instead of just Joseph of Arimathea, we have Joseph, plus we have now uh, Nicodemus who are there wrapping the body in John's gospel. So, you know, the number of witnesses to this whole thing are, are being increased uh, as we go from one gospel to another. Um, so uh, it, it's not so solidly established that uh, they found the tomb to be empty. And if they found the tomb to be empty, they can be guaranteed that they went to the correct tomb and all of that. But let's say the tomb was found empty for the, you know, take that, given that, uh, giving that, uh, and taking that for granted. Now, the next question is, um, you know, what happened to his body? So um, Mary of Magdalene, Mary of Magdala uh, responded quickly in John's gospel by saying they took the body. And so who took the body? She thought the body was physically moved by somebody. Um, we can say that God translated his body from the tomb into heaven. And uh, may I add that this seems to have been a, an early Christian belief. And this seems to be the belief that, as the, that, that is uh, at the basis of Mark's gospel. Because Mark's gospel ends with the women uh, coming to the tomb, finding it to be empty. And then chapter 16, verse number 8 says that they fled from this scene, um, saying nothing to anyone because they, uh, they were afraid. Uh, so uh, the story ends right there, and um, uh, it does not end with Jesus coming and appearing and you know discussing with his disciples and so on. So it could be that some early Christians uh, thought that the Jesus's body was translated right from the tomb. And if I recall correctly, Reginald Fuller, in his uh, book uh, 
book uh, on um, the, uh, the two books now that I have in mind, and I can't remember which book it was, uh, either his uh, book on uh, the New Testament in current study, uh, or uh, there's another book whose title I do not recall now uh, that seems to analyze the resurrection. I think it's called the resurrection narratives, something of this nature, in which he says that this is obviously a reflection of an early Christian belief that Jesus was taken up right from the tomb. Okay, uh, Nahian, uh, were there conf conflict between James, followers of Jesus, and Paul? Yes, and this has been pointed out by a notable Christian scholar, uh, James D.G. Dunn, in his book entitled Jesus, the Evidence. Uh, Salu uh, asking, do, do, Doctor, some Christians say that there was a man, Joseph, who was a friend of Mary, and Jesus was their son. Is that true? We Muslims are new to this topic, as we know that Maryam uh, was the most pious of women and hence uh, she cannot have a friend relationship with uh, any man. Who was this Joseph and what was his relationship with Mariam alayhi salam? Now this uh, Joseph according to the Bible was actually the husband of Mary. Um, uh, but there is some vagueness about the way in which this is uh, said and, and uh, you know, how this corresponds to Jewish marriage practices at the time. This has been uh, discussed by uh, Bishop John Shelby Spong in his book entitled Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism. He, he pointed out, and uh, I have not investigated the matter further, but he pointed out that there were two uh, there was a two-stage marriage. First, it would be uh, the kind of basic agreement uh, that uh, would allow people to see each other, to that the married couple to see each other, but they're not really living together. And then uh, there is the actual event when they come to live together. So it could be in this interim period that in, in which uh, Jesus, Mary is found to be pregnant. Um, so there's some vagueness there, but nonetheless, uh, it's not the Gospels are not depicting Joseph as the boyfriend of, of Mary. The Gospels are saying this was the husband of, of Mary, um, but nonetheless, that she became pregnant before they came together. Nahian. Uh, oh, and, and to answer your basic question, do we have to say anything about that? Well, there's nothing about that in the Quran or in the Islamic tradition that I'm aware of. Uh, so we can say, okay, if, you know, we can just take that as a, a, a basic presupposition of our Christian friends and not dispute the fact. Um, and I don't see any, any reason to, to dispute um, the, the, the fact. However, we can say that if Joseph was uh, already known to be the husband of Mary, then why would there be uh, some fuss? Like, why would, why would people um, later on be uh, thinking that, uh, that Mary did something wrong because she had a husband? Um, the Quran shows that people think that there was something wrong. The Bible is not so explicit about that, but Christian scholars have noticed that in John's Gospel, for example, where Jesus' uh, opponents uh, are arguing with him, they say, you know, we are not sons of a harlot and, uh, or something of this nature. Uh, so it, as if there is an insinuation that something is not quite right about the way in which Jesus was, was born. And um, uh, someone has actually written a book. Uh, I think her name is Elizabeth Schaefer. Uh, her book is called uh, The Illegitimacy of Jesus. Um, so some people have, have thought that there's something wrong about the way in which Jesus was born and, uh, and that the gospels are covering it up in a way. Um, of course, the Quran is very clear that uh, that Jesus was born uh, by God saying "be," and he was. So God is in control of that whole affair, and 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 Mary comes out uh, clean in in the in the Quranic narrative. Okay, uh, Nahyan, did zombies of Matthew uh, twenty seven verses fifty one to fifty two happen? You know, Michael Kona has written a book about uh, the Gospels and why they differ. So it's a uh, uh, entitled something like why are there differences in the gospels and uh, before that he has written a book called uh, well something to do with the resurrection i don't remember the exact title but something about the historiographic the historiography of the resurrection something of this nature a very huge volume and i debated with him a few times um 
so in in that in in both books he points out that uh, this uh, description in Matthew is what he calls special effects so he's not saying that this is really what happened this is like special effects <coughs> alhamdulillah excuse me well, it's a good thing uh, that uh, you cannot catch COVID from me through this uh, broadcast. <laughs> and uh, well, alhamdulillah, we thank Allah that uh, so far I, I don't, um, I, you know, I have not uh, become sick from COVID. I've never tested positive for, for it. Uh, may Allah want to bless us and protect us all. I think my legs were just being a bit cold and uh, I just covered my legs with the, um, with the sweater. Okay, so... Um, this whole discussion about special effects reminds me, and I need to end this broadcast soon, so I'll try to be brief with your questions, but I'll um, answer this one in the way I was just going to do. Uh, one of my grandsons, uh, when he was uh, much younger, um, uh, he, he liked to talk to me, um, you know, by, by video over uh, Facebook Messenger. And he liked that because he can use special effects. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he would appear, like, I, don't, I don't remember, like with a mustache, with a special hat, something like this. And uh, and he used to have a lot of fun doing that. And um, uh, he didn't realize that I, I really liked to see him as he was. Like, uh, you know, just his face is enjoyable for me to look at. Um, I don't need these special effects. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, the Gospels give us special effects. So sometimes we have to remove these special effects in order to see the real Jesus and see what really happened on the ground. So this, uh, according to Michael Lacona, is special effects. It's not really a historical um, event. Now, Jan, uh, was Mary the mother of Jesus uh, witness to the, to the crucifixion scene? I found it very strange because Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention it, only John's Gospel mention it. And yes, now, Jan, for the same reason, uh, we would all find it strange. It seems that this is John's way of solidifying the, the argument for the resurrection of Jesus. That, you know, we, we can be sure he died because, look, even his mother is right there at the scene uh, to, to verify the fact of Jesus' death. Otherwise, when you have him walking around later on, people are going to naturally ask, well, how do you know he was dead in the first place? Well, John is trying to solidify that story. Salvo, Dr. Shabir, once you said that uh, Allah may forgive the Christians on the Day of Judgment because they were preached the corrupted version of the Bible and hence they were kept in the dark, then why does the Quran say that people will come to Jesus on the Day of Judgment saying that, did you say? Quran say, uh, saying, Oh Lord, we perform wonders and miracles, but you mean the Bible says that, right? Matthew's gospel says that in chapter seven. Uh, and so, um, and he will say, get away from me. I never knew you. Um, so why does Jesus hate them when you are saying that the Christians might be forgiven by Allah? So, you know, that, that of course is mixing the two perspectives, the Quran and, and the Bible. But let's say uh, from, from the Quranic perspective, it is possible that if people did not know the truth or they, and they were not in a position to know the truth, then Allah will, Allah will judge them based on what they were in a position to know. Um, from the biblical perspective, it, if we take that, it could be that uh, there are some people who are in the position to, to know and, and yet they did the wrong thing, so Jesus will disown them. It doesn't mean that they will Will disown uh, he will disown all uh, of the people who did not um, uh, who were not like including those who were not in a position to know uh, salu salman dr shabir i've seen your oldest debates where your beard was black and you were still very young but i still see uh, that same energy and same enthusiasm even th today with but the difference is that the beard has turned gray uh, love you dr shabir for your work of dawa uh, and your super intelligent brain. Thank you, my brother. Uh, keep making dua for me. May Allah Subhanahu preserve us and uh, continue to use us in the service of his religion and give us all of the blessings that are needed uh, to continue uh, with that uh, mission. I do, I do admit, though, thank you for your good wishes and, uh, and uh, generous evaluation. Uh, but I do admit that as I get older, I get a little bit slower. And uh, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his uh, protection and uh, guidance. Uh, Nahian is saying, what was the main reason Jesus uh, was killed? Our Christian friends say that Jesus was crucified because he claimed divinity. What do you think? Uh, uh, why Jews and Romans want uh, Jesus dead? Now, uh, the, the Christian idea that they, they killed Jesus because he, Jesus was claiming to be God. Um, this Now, let, let's say that Jesus already proved that he is God and then he is now claiming it uh, so and now 
the, the Jews are trying to put him to death. That makes no sense because it's like they could see clearly that this guy is God. And uh, just because he said what they already knew, that he is God, they're thinking, okay, this guy is God and he's claiming to be God. So let's kill him. Let, let's kill God. Like who's, who in his right mind is going to think, let's kill God? It, it doesn't make any sense, especially for the Jews who were like religious people and they're trying dutifully to observe all of the small commandments of God, big and small, whatever they thought to be the commandments of God, they're trying dutifully to obey it. Well, why are they going to think, let's kill God? It doesn't make any sense. Now, let's say that Jesus did not uh, prove that, that he was God and now he claimed it. So now they're going to think this is a human being. He's blaspheming by claiming that he's God. Okay, and he deserves death according to the Old Testament, which we are following, which is the book of God. So that means they would kill him according to God's law. And that would make Jesus irresponsible. Like if he is God, uh, why doesn't he prove it first before claiming it? Or even after he claims it, and he needs, sees now that people are going to kill him because he claimed it, uh, let him do something to show, wait, hey, oh, wait a minute, I am God after all. Like you guys are mistaken here. Don't kill me because you're going to kill your God here. I am, I am your God. He should protest and not only protest, but he should prove to them now uh, by doing something like, uh, you know, it's in, like in the movies or something where uh, you find that, uh, you know, one person is kidnapped and the other one wants to know, is that really uh, my lover on, on the other side? And uh, then, you know, he says, OK, uh, uh, just t t tell me, where did we first meet? Um, and, and that's a piece of knowledge that only he knows, that only his uh, his, his wife would know. Uh, so then she tells him and then he knows, okay, you know, they've got the right person there. Um, so Jesus at this point could tell them something that only God would know. And, um, you know, to prove that he is really God. But uh, on the other hand, we see that sometimes he's admitting that he doesn't know when the hour will occur or something like this. Uh, so uh, to say that Jesus claimed to be God uh, doesn't doesn't make any any sense. That's not the reason why he was uh, he was crucified. Um, he, um, uh, as I mentioned in John's Gospel, they thought better to have him um, cr crucified by the Romans than to let the Romans come down and you know wreak havoc on the entire uh, Jewish uh, nation. So. Um, that, that, that was an obvious uh, reason. Even if John's gospel is not to be trusted for that particular statement, uh, then the overall conclusion from historians is that uh, just as the gospels say that the charge against Jesus was written on his cross to the effect that he is claiming to be the king of the Jews, uh, then this is why he was crucified, not for claiming that he is God, but for claiming that he is the king of the Jews, meaning instead of uh, Caesar, um, being the emperor, uh, Jesus is going to be king. Uh, to, and that would mean the overthrow of the Roman rule. That's treason. And he was killed for treason from the Roman point of view. And uh, Nahian, finally, what, what's your view on John 16:12? Uh, is it about the Holy Spirit or another future person? I would say that this is about another future person, Brother Nahian. Uh, but John's gospel has turned the whole thing into uh, a, a prediction about uh, the Holy Spirit. But we can see there are still indications there about another person to come after Jesus. And some Christian scholars themselves have uh, pointed out something to that effect, such as Hans Windisch. That's all the time that uh, I can spend with you today, my brothers and sisters. I thank you all for joining me. Thank you for all for those to those who have shared my post. I see Noor Bay Bayan Moha has already also done that. Uh, thank you all and uh, may Allah SWT bless you all and protect you all and all of your loved ones. Uh, please continue to support my humble work and uh, join me for future discussions in which I'll continue to walk through the Gospel of Mark and I'll present other uh, important uh, data and, and uh, commentary inshallah. Please support my work by going to our website islaminfo.com and click on the donate button. Send me a donation uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can continue this good work for his sake. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. You can also go to my personal website shabirali.com and you can donate there as well. You can also send me a question which uh, God willing I will uh, soon get around to answering and the answers will be posted on our website for the benefit of all. So thank you all again for joining me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Bless you all and all of the people around you. Fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.